Solving General Chemistry Problems Thermodynamics Here is a typical question. What does the entropy change when heating 50 grams of ice from minus 18 Celsius up to 22 Celsius? Now, all we have so far is this relation of delta S is greater than or equal to Q over T. So how do we proceed? Well, here's another question. A container of two moles of nitrogen gas, which we will treat as an ideal gas, is held at a temperature of 320 Kelvin and a volume of 50 liters. It is then heated and compressed so that the final temperature is 350 Kelvin and a final volume of 35 liters. What is the change in entropy? It's still not clear how to proceed from Clausius's expression to these word problems. While entropy has historically been a difficult concept to understand, the math involved in its calculation is not hard. Clausius first gave this relation between the flow of energy in the form of heat and the entropy change. Because of the greater than or equal to sign, students can be puzzled as to how to deal with this. Conceptually, this is important because it's what allows for the widely stated idea that the entropy of the universe is increasing. We want to get down to a more specific case and ask, when does the equal sign apply? This requires the discussion of two terms, quasi-static and reversible. When applied to a chemical or physical process, quasi-static means that the process occurs so slowly that the system is always in internal equilibrium. Consider, for instance, compressing a gas in a hand pump. If you push hard down on the plunger, the gas molecules closest to the piston are pushed first and they in turn help to create a pressure wave that propagates down the cylinder body. At any instant, there are regions of the gas which have a different pressure than other regions. If completed quasi-statically, the piston would be moved so slowly that the internal pressure throughout would always be equal. It would be increasing, but it would be uniform throughout. Heat exchange can be similarly considered. A continuous series of equilibrium states achieved through an infinitely slow process is what characterizes quasi-static. Clearly, clearly, we can never achieve this in practice, though with patience we can approach it. By comparison, a reversible process is not only quasi-static, but in addition must also be in thermodynamic equilibrium. The idea behind reversibility is that, it, is that if we make the right infinitesimal change to the conditions, the process will start to go in the reverse direction. An example might be the flow of heat between two bodies. If one is infinitesimally colder than the other, then heat will flow from the hot to the cold body in infinitesimal amounts. But if we increase the temperature of the colder body infinitesimally, it becomes the hotter body, and the direction of heat flow is reversed. However, if we have two bodies where one is hotter than the other by a finite amount, we are still able to engineer the infinitesimally slow heat flow between them, and we may still have a quasi-static process, but if we change the temperature of one of the bodies by an infinitesimal amount, the heat still flows in the same direction. It's not reversible. In thermodynamics, we are interested in reversible processes, which must be both quasi-static and in thermodynamic equilibrium. Now, we may in some instances start to approach these conditions, but their significance lies in the theoretical understanding that can be derived from it. In fact, we will find that we can capitalize on the state function nature of entropy and combine a series of reversible steps to calculate entropy changes in irreversible processes. These reversible processes become our fundamental building blocks. It is in a reversible process when the equal sign in Clausius's expression applies to the relationship between heat and entropy. We need to introduce a new bit of notation by writing Clausius's equation in a differential form. An infinitesimal change in entropy arises from an infinitesimal transfer of energy in the form of heat. You are familiar with the notation ds being a differential amount of entropy, but in the notation with the heat q we are using a lowercase delta instead of a d, and this may be unfamiliar to you. Because heat is dependent upon path, the differential amount of heat is an inexact differential. In your calculus classes, you might have learned about the fundamental theorem of calculus, which allows the calculation of the integral by just subtracting its value at the beginning from its value at the end. This can happen when working with exact differentials. In thermodynamics, 
The state function properties all have exact differentials associated with them, ds, dh, du, dg, etc. This is why they are state functions. But not so with heat and work, which are inexact differentials, and for which paths must be specified if calculations are to be completed. Using the lower case delta in place of the d, it's basically there to remind us of this fact. In some cases, it is possible to exchange an inexact differential, turn it into an exact differential, by the use of an integrating factor and the specification of the path. This is what happens here. The integrating factor is 1 over t, and the path is specified to be reversible. With that, we obtain the relation ds equals delta q reversible over temperature. We can now select some specific processes and integrate this expression to find new relations for entropy changes in those cases. Remember that an underlying requirement in all cases is that the changes occur reversibly. The approach is to find expressions for the delta Q differential under these various conditions. Perhaps the simplest process we can consider is heating or cooling a solid or a liquid. We can imagine that being done reversibly, just bring it into contact with a temperature bath that is infinitesimally hotter or colder, transfer an infinitesimal amount of heat, change the temperature bath infinitesimally, and continue. The heat capacity of that solid or liquid is what allows us to calculate the amount of heat transferred. There is a difference when heating or cooling under conditions of constant pressure or constant volume. When done at constant pressure, a portion of the energy transferred is used to do work, while the balance changes the temperature. At constant volume, all of the energy is used to change the temperature since no work is being done. However, in the case of solids and liquids, they are only slightly compressible. Their volume changes very little with even large changes in pressure or temperature. The difference between constant pressure and constant volume is very small, for solids and liquids at least. In general chemistry, we take that the constant pressure heat capacity is about equal to the constant volume heat capacity, and we just call it the heat capacity. So we can write Q equals NC delta T, or delta Q equals NC dT, where N is the number of moles of material and C is the heat capacity. And we usually just use CP, the molar constant pressure heat capacity, because it's the one that's most usually available. There should also be a volume change component to the entropy change, and we'll see this shortly with gases. But with solids and liquids, over modest temperature changes, the volume changes are small and can be ignored, as with the heat capacity differences. In general chemistry, this is what is always done. The heat capacity values are rather complex expressions of temperature. They are sometimes represented as a second-order polynomial, and sometimes as even higher-order functions. When used, it just complicates the integration. It's not difficult mathematically, it just takes a bit more time. In general chemistry, however, we usually simplify this by considering the heat capacity to just be a constant. And this is what we will do here. Replace delta Q in Clausius's expression, and we have the equation for heating or cooling a liquid or a solid. This can be integrated over the desired temperature range. Again, assuming the heat capacity is constant and that the process has been arranged to be completely reversible. Entropy changes for heating or cooling are given by this expression. Remember that this is applicable to solids and liquids because the effect of volume changes is negligible, at least in general chemistry. Phase transitions, melting, freezing, boiling, condensing, sublimating, proceed without a change in temperature. There is a flow of energy in the form of heat, but the energy all goes into changing the phase of the material rather than its temperature. Once all of the material has changed phase, then additional heat transfer begins to change the temperature of the material in its new phase. The enthalpy of the phase transition at constant pressure is the heat transferred. The reversibility is ensured by imagining a heat sink at an infinitesimally higher or lower as needed temperature than that of the phase transition, continually providing or absorbing heat to go to or from the sample being studied. The temperature is the temperature of the phase transition. This makes the connection to Clausius's equation very easy. Here is a straightforward connection between the enthalpy of a phase transition, its entropy change, 
and the temperature at which the phase transition occurs. With any two of these three values, we can always determine the third. You do need to remember the names of the transitions. The only one that's perhaps not familiar is fusion, and that's just the same as melting. The others you likely know or can figure out. A key to these values is to remember that melting or vaporizing always requires the input of energy, and so the enthalpy change and the entropy change must both be positive. Conversely, freezing or condensing must always be negative since energy must always be removed to drive the phase change. So with these changes, with these equations, you can readily calculate entropy changes associated with the heating or cooling of solids or liquids, and for changes in phases involving them. The properties you need are heat capacities, enthalpies of transitions, and phase transition temperatures. Now what remains is to determine how to deal with gases. They too have a heat capacity, and the heating and cooling could be related similarly as for solids and liquids. The difference, however, is that while we were able to ignore volume changes with condensed phase materials, because those changes were so small, we can no longer do that with gases, and we have to account for changes in temperature, volume, and pressure. This is a little more complicated. Here is how we can approach the problem. Now, I will go through the derivation quickly. I just don't think you need to reproduce it, so it's, just, it's useful for you to be convinced of the source of the equations. Now here is the first law of thermodynamics written in differential form. The equations that follow are based on the first law, so they are universally applicable. We can rearrange it to solve for delta Q. We know the definition of work is minus P delta V. So in a differential form, that expression is delta W equals minus P dV. We can substitute for delta W to get DU plus P dV. Now the du term comes from some heat capacity considerations. If the volume is constant, then no PV work can be done, and delta U is equal to Q. A calorimetry experiment that measures a change in temperature but no volume change can relate the change in temperature to heat transferred and hence to the change in internal energy. We have du is equal to N CV dt, where CV is the constant volume heat capacity and N is the number of moles. This can be substituted to give delta Q equals NCV dt plus PdV. Now this is simply a rewriting of the first law. It is exact for all materials. However, the exactness requires knowing exactly how CV depends upon T and how P depends upon V. Data is available that could be used, but the equation would end up being unique for every substance. Instead, in general chemistry, we take on a restricted view of those variables in order to achieve a more straightforward understanding of entropy. That restriction is that we take CV to be a constant, and we take the ideal gas law to describe the PV relationship. PV equals nRT is rearranged to give P equals nRT over V. This can now be substituted in for P to give delta Q equals N CV dt plus nRT over V dV. Now substitute this expression for delta Q into Clausius's expression, and we now have terms that only involve exact differentials. Multiply through by the 1 over t term and inspect the equation. Note how both variables, t and v, appear as reciprocal functions, 1 over t and 1 over v. Use now what, we, what you know about integration on this uh, equation. We know how to integrate the reciprocal function, it's just the natural logarithm. We obtain the following. This relation holds for any change of state of an ideal gas. This is how one can calculate entropy changes involving the changes of temperature and volume of a gas. If the temperature is held constant, isothermal, which means that T2 is equal to T1, so that the temperature ratio is just T1 over T1, which is 1, and hence ln of 1 is 0, then it reduces to this expression. And conversely, if the volume is held constant, and that's what's called isochoric, then it reduces to this variant of the equation. If we have data for temperature and pressure change, then within the ideal gas paradigm, we can rewrite the first equation as this. Note how all of these expressions are how changes of state of gases, temperature, pressure, and volume 
can be used to calculate entropy changes of gases. For the purposes of general chemistry, to reach these expressions, we've restricted those gases to be ideal and the heat capacity to be constant. What is important is that the mathematical form gives us a perspective on the general way entropy will change with changes in a gas's temperature, volume, and pressure. Note how it depends logarithmically on the ratio of those changes. That is the important takeaway message. Return now to the problem stated at the beginning. Here is the first one. So what information do we need? Well, the heat capacity values and the enthalpy of fusion. Also the molar mass if the quantities we find are molar in nature. Enthalpy of fusion, 6.01 kilojoules per mole. Heat capacity of ice, the solid, is 37.2 joules per kelvin mole. And heat capacity of water, liquid, 75.4 joules per kelvin mole. A reminder that solids and liquids are rather incompressible. If you try to squeeze them, their volume doesn't change much. Hence their CV and CP values in a given phase are close to the same, and we will consider them to be the same. Remember that the same is not true of gases. With this data, we can find the entropy change for the process of heating the ice, melting it to water, and then heating the water. Because these are molar quantities, we first need to determine the moles of water involved. Its molar mass is 18 grams per mole, so 50 grams is 2.78 moles. Also, be careful to use temperature units of Kelvin. The temperature ratio in Celsius is not the same as the ratio in Kelvin and will give the wrong answer. We have minus 18 Celsius equals 255 Kelvin and 22 Celsius equals 295 Kelvin. Now we can solve this problem in three steps using the general equations we developed earlier. First, heat the ice to its melting point, which we know is 273 Kelvin. 2.78 moles times 37.2 joules per Kelvin mole times ln of 273 over 255 is 7.05 joules per Kelvin. Number two, melt the ice at 273 Kelvin. Be sure to watch out for the difference between kilojoules and joules. 2.78 moles times 6,010 joules divided by 273 Kelvin is 61.2 joules per Kelvin. Three, heat the liquid water from its melting point. 2.78 moles times 75.4 joules per Kelvin mole times ln of 295 over 273 equals 16.2 joules per Kelvin. And the total entropy change is therefore 7.05 plus 61.2 plus 16.2 or 84.5 joules per Kelvin. Notice how the largest contribution to the overall change came from the melting process itself, which is about 72%. Changing from a solid to liquid clearly entails a large change in entropy. The rest, which is about 28%, was just from the heating. Here's the other question. This is about heating and compressing gases. Because gases are so compressible, now there is a difference between a constant volume and a constant pressure process. The additional information you need is CV. As we are treating this as an ideal gas, we will take its constant volume heat capacity to be 2.5 R, where R is the universal gas constant. We just need to substitute the values into the equation. Delta S equals 2 times 2.5 R times ln 350 over 320 plus 2 times R times ln 35 over 50. That's 3.73 minus 5.93 or minus 2.20 joules per Kelvin. Note how the increasing temperature tends to increase the entropy, but the compression lowers the entropy. Overall, in this case, the entropy decreases. This equation for entropy change is used when you have arbitrary changes in temperature and volume. The other version given earlier is used if the data for temperature and pressure are given. Sometimes processes are controlled by holding one of these properties constant. Isothermal is constant temperature, isobaric is constant pressure, or isochoric is constant volume. The constant property naturally implies the same value at the beginning as at the end. The ratio is therefore 1, log of 1 is 0, and therefore that term disappears. You should play with these equations a bit and see some of these implications.